impact you could have in this world. Graham Hancock is with us, the legendary Graham Hancock, author of Fingerprints of the Gods that changed most of our consciousnesses forever. Most all of us are familiar with this extraordinary book about the human past and the possibility that civilization has undergone undergone radical changes and is a cyclic phenomenon rather than simply a linear phenomenon that we go back many, many thousands of years. And now he has done something that is quite frankly amazing. Uh, He has got a new book out called Supernatural. And let me begin by saying that I really can't introduce Graham Hancock. Uh, he is a, an adventurer par excellence, a, uh, a advanced with advanced ad- abilities in undersea uh, work. He has d- done a perfectly marvelous book called Underworld, and has about uh, a, a, the a, a submerged uh, archaeological uh, remains around the world. Uh, he's just done so much and Graham I can't I I really have no words to say except I'm so glad you're here thank you Whitley I much much appreciate that that introduction yeah I mean I think the 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 background story of my work is has, has, has always been that I try to get as deeply as possible into the subjects I'm investigating and that's why for Underworld I learned to scuba dive and with my wife Santa who's a photographer we went diving more than 2,000 times uh, all around the world looking for uh, structures that were submerged by rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age a missing chapter in in human history and the, and the same approach that I must get directly involved with my subject uh, is, uh, is is the, the motif behind my, my new book, uh, Supernatural. Supernatural. Uh, which, by the way, folks, you can get from the unknowncountry.com store, and I'm sure it's in bookstores everywhere as well. Let's set the stage. Let's go back 50,000 years. Mankind has no art, no religion. There's no symbolism, no innovative thinking. Where have we come from? Graham, at this point in our history, Where, what 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 do we look back on in the past? Well, it's really it's really rather extraordinary. Uh, you can trace the story of the of the human career uh, in the uh, archaeological record for for six million years back to the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee. To be sure, there are missing bits and pieces of the story, but the story is increasingly well understood, and. Uh, the, the, what, what you see over those six million years is a very slow, gradual evolution of the physical form of human beings. We begin to look more and more like humans and less and less like apes. And that process is completely finished by 200,000 years ago when human beings ex- existed on the planet who were anatomically identical to you or I, anatomically and genetically identical, and whose brain size uh, was the same as ours and as complex as ours. However, uh, this gradual evolution to anatomical modernity is not accompanied uh, by an evolution in human behavior. Uh, frankly speaking, that six million years back to the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee is six million years of incredible, turgid boredom. Our ancestors were dull, dull-witted and uninteresting, with, with no culture, as you said, and no religion, no art, no symbolism. They probably didn't even use language. And this continues to be the case even after they are anatomically modern. And it's not until 50,000 years ago, more than 150,000 years after our ancestors started to look like us, it's 150,000 years later, just 50,000 years ago, that, 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 or even after that, that what we can instantly recognize as human behavior suddenly switches on in the archaeological record all around the world. It's as though a light has been switched on in the human brain. And, and, and the clearest evidence of this uh, comes not from improved hunting strategies, although those are clearly there, not from evidence of lateral thinking, uh, but from evidence of belief in abstract ideas, like the afterlife, it's clear that our ancestors start to believe that something goes on after death because they bury 
food and, 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 and water and containers of food with the dead. This clearly implies a belief in the soul. And most importantly of all, at exactly the same time, they begin to produce this absolutely stunning and amazing and beautiful and wonderful cave and rock art all around the world. Uh, when Picasso first went into the cave of Lascaux in France, which is, uh, which is close to 20,000 years old, he came out and said, we have invented nothing. And yet this amazing art just comes out of nowhere. After six million years of dull and interesting boredom, our ancestors suddenly start to paint. And from the no. very beginning, what they're painting is not naturalistic scenes, but paintings of beings that simply do not exist in the natural world, supernatural beings, in other words. Now, this we, we're going to get into the issue of exactly why this happened in a few minutes. But what I want to ask you about first is that mysterious 150,000 years, because it's breathtakingly long. Uh, it, yes. it, you know, the we know of a civilization that we've lived in that has about a five to 7,000-year traceable history, depending on what part of the world you're talking about. But 150,000 years when the brain was ready to become yeah. a mind and just didn't. How mysterious yeah. that seems to me. It is. It is deeply uh, mysterious. And, uh, and what it suggests, to me, is that some kind of uh, some kind of trigger factor uh, was needed to push humanity on to the next stage in our evolution, and that stage begins to be clearly marked about 35,000 years ago, yes. when we see the first, the earliest surviving evidence of of this fantastic uh, cave art all around the world. It's very difficult to explain why this happened. You would have thought with fully anatomically modern brains would have come fully anatomically modern behavior, but it didn't. There was this very long delay just Dif occasionally in the archaeological record. You get a little glimpse of something happening, as though somebody is getting the idea of what it is to be human, and then it disappears again. So I think what happens at 35,000 years ago is some kind of critical mass is reached when a huge change in consciousness sweeps over the whole of human civilization, human, human culture all around the world. Now, what's interesting about supernatural is that Graham Hancock, who, as you've heard, is no armchair investigator, has solved this enigma by going on a journey that took place right at home. This is one, he did some traveling for this book, don't get me wrong, but not all of the traveling involved jet airplanes and hiking boots by any means. Uh, but first, before we get into the most extraordinary part of this journey, Graham, I have to ask you, you have seen some of the, in fact, all, I believe, of the most extraordinary cave art in the world. And I wondered what its emotional impact on you was. You must have had. A, 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 yes, you, I know I you have, went have, deeply have. into caves that we can't. Most people can't even enter anymore. That's that's right. Uh, the the archaeological establishment has reserved most of these caves for themselves, and it's extremely difficult to get permission to to go into them. But my goodness, when you do go into one of these great caves, totally alone in darkness, just with very low wattage electric lighting that's been installed in some of them, uh, you find yourself um, in literally another world. Uh, I have visited, I've been lucky enough to visit some of the great monuments uh, on this planet, the great pyramids of, of Giza, for, for example, which are, which are wonderful and awe-inspiring places. But I can say that these painted caves uh, in southwest Europe uh, stand on a par uh, with the great pyramid in terms of the effect that they had on me a very powerful effect a sense of a sense of coming coming to to the place where you lift the veil and see through to the reality behind human existence so these are deep and profound inquiries uh, into the nature of reality that are painted on these caves and you know sometimes there's a very human touch you'll see a you'll see a handprint painted on the cave wall in fact what the artist did was hold his or her hand up to the wall and then blow paint uh, over the back of the hand, uh, leaving a, 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 a silhouette, and, and you have a, you just have that that eerie sense of contact with another human being twenty or thirty five thousand years ago, uh, who, who who stood there in that cave and and 
in the darkness for, 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 for a motivation that, that our, our scientists today find very hard to understand, created these, these amazing works of art. You know, it's not art for art's sake, where you would expect the art to be on view. This is art that's in the deepest and darkest corners of caves, but sometimes extends two or three miles underground. Truly a, a, an incredible mystery. Now, we're going to take a little break now. Graham Hancock's website is grahamhancock.com. And I might tell you that it is updated very frequently with wonderful stories that are germane to your understanding of the true human past. So visit it a lot. It's not just static like most author websites. It's a very much of a living monument to our own past and a place of discovery in and of itself. His new book, Supernatural, available in bookstores everywhere, available from the unknowncountry.com bookstore. And when we do get back, we are going to talk about one of the great mysteries of all time. I'll tell you right now what it is. It's dots. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. We're talking to Graham Hancock, his new book, Supernatural. Don't miss it. You have read Graham Hancock's past books, many of them. I know you probably all have. And this one is stunning. It is a journey unlike anything you have ever seen anyone else take, author or not. And we're getting into why that is. His website. GrahamHancock.com, beautiful, updated frequently, go to it frequently. When we left the air, we were going to, I promised that we would talk about a great mystery. And Graham, I'm going to leave it to you to tell us why dots are so important. Yes. Well, uh, to preface this, uh, archaeologists have been studying cave art for about 100 years. That was when the first cave art was really recognized for what it was, about, about 100 years ago. And for, for most of that time, very sadly and very unfortunately, although they have claimed total possession of the caves, they have not come up with any valid explanation for what the motivation behind this art was, for what was going on inside the heads of the artists. It's only really since the 1980s that a, that a new theory has been put forward and solidly backed up with evidence that explains all of this. And that's the work of Professor David Lewis Williams from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. To cut a long story very short indeed, what he shows us is that clues as to the meaning and inspiration of this amazing art are to be found in the art itself. And he comes at this from a very unexpected direction. Uh, which is modern neuropsychological research. Uh, it so happens in the 1950s, 1960s, even a bit into the 70s, um, many scientists in the West were allowed to conduct research into consciousness with human volunteers using hallucinogens, like, uh, for example, LSD or DMT, dimethyltryptamine. And these volunteers were asked to describe the experiences they had and to draw what they saw. Very interestingly, and this is absolutely universal across human beings from any culture or place, what they see in these altered states of consciousness usually begins with strange geometrical patterns, lots and lots of dots, sometimes open dots, sometimes closed dots, which seem to flow like a waterfall sometimes, scintillating and, and brightly colored, zigzag lines, wavy lines, grids. These, are, these, these, these kind of patterns are universally experienced in altered states of consciousness. And then, as the altered state of consciousness deepens, the lab volunteers reported meeting beings as, if, as though they had gone into some sort of strange parallel universe and they started to meet beings of the kind that we do not see in everyday life. Typically, they would be part animal and part human in appearance. And typically, they would seem to want to communicate with the volunteers to have something to, to say to them. And what David Lewis Williams realized and has absolutely demonstrated, and his theory is now pretty much accepted by the mainstream. Oddly enough, this is one of the few times in my career where, where I find myself agreeing with the mainstream, is that the art of the painted cave was an art of vision, of vision that our ancestors 
had, had perhaps stumbled across hallucinogenic plants, perhaps uh, mushrooms like the liberty cap, uh, Psilocybe semilanceata, which has grown in, 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 in Europe uh, since the beginning of time, and, and uh, that they had first consumed these plants as food items, uh, but then they had discovered their extraordinary uh, mental effects, that they experienced these visions, that, that creatures and beings that were not present in their real physical world were nevertheless appeared in front of them, and that they attempted to reproduce this experience by going into the cave. Uh, in, in many cases, the atmosphere of the cave is very similar to the atmosphere of an altered state of consciousness, and painting on the walls the patterns, the geometrical patterns, the dots, the zigzag lines, and also the strange beings that they saw and encountered and interacted with in these altered states of consciousness. And this, for the first time, explains why all over the world, it doesn't matter whether it's Europe in the Upper Paleolithic, whether it's South Africa in the Middle Stone Age, whether it's Australia, whether it's uh, the, the Americas, it doesn't matter where it is, the cave and rock art all shows these same features, beings that are part animal, part human, supernatural beings, in other words, and these amazing patterns uh, that, that keep cropping up again and again in, in different countries and cultures that were totally unconnected to each other. So the, the, the explanation that's given for this is that all of this work was done by shamans who had entered altered states of consciousness probably by using plant hallucinogens, and that after they returned to normal consciousness, they sought to memorialize what they had seen on the walls of the cave. And because human neurology is the same all around the world, naturally enough, people see all the same things. Uh, but for me, this explanation really just doesn't go nearly far enough. Uh, it, 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 it does provide an explanation for the cave art, but unfortunately, most of the researchers who've worked in this field have never taken hallucinogens themselves and have never, ever experienced an altered state of consciousness. So they can't understand how powerful and how convincing uh, these experiences are, and they will just never consider the possibility that I do explore at length in Supernatural, yes. which is that actually these experiences are real. They are real experiences, but in a sense not understood yet by Western science. Uh, uh, and that uh, which... to access these experiences, sorry, to access these experiences, we must adjust our state of consciousness. Now, we're going to talk a little later about the degree to which we must adjust our state of consciousness. However, you refer in your book extensively to the research of Dr. Rick Strassman, who's been on this program right after he published DMT, The Spirit Molecule, because I believe, and I think I'm quite correct in this, that human civilization did not begin until we began to come into contact with a parallel universe and that these drugs are the means, or one of the means, by which we come into contact with it. So why don't you expand on your own studies in this direction a little bit more, if you will? Well, well that's, that's, abs that's absolutely right. Rick, Rick Strassman's work is really, is really of fundamental importance in this field, and I do report it at some, at some length in, in Supernatural. His work is so important. He was the first um, scientist in America uh, for, for more than 20 years to be allowed to conduct direct research with hallucinogens and human volunteers and to get them to report their experiences. And he used DMT, dimethyltryptamine. And, and um, what, what really stunned him was that all his volunteers seemed to be going to the same places and coming back reporting encounters and experiences with the same, quote-unquote, uh, su supernatural beings. And he, he began to realize that this astonishing universality uh, could not be explained by the notion that there was some kind of brain module for experiencing part animal, part human creatures. It, the best possible explanation for it were that these encounters were actually real. And, and, and Rick speculated that uh, this may have something to do with with, with, with the notion of parallel universes that has, has, is already fully accepted by, by quantum physicists. But maybe the answer, maybe the way to get into a parallel universe is not, uh, is not through mil building sort of multi-billion dollar gigantic scientific instruments like the Large Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland, but actually the answer already lies inside our own heads, that what we need to do is to adjust the receiver wavelength of our brains. Uh, but normally we are tuned 
very much 100% tuned into this physical world. We must be in order to function in this competitive world. But that it is possible to retune the receiver wavelength of the brain to pick up other realities, uh, and that these realities may be of fundamental importance to us. And certainly the link in cave art between evidence that our ancestors were exploring altered states of consciousness and an amazing, fantastic leap forward in, in the human story uh, is, is very clear and, and suggests that these encounters were indeed fundamental uh, in making us human. Really remarkable. Really extraordinary. The new book, Supernatural, Graham Hancock. Get it in any bookstore. Get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore and give us a little boost. His website, GrahamHancock.com, not to be missed. This is important stuff because it is about the confluence between our world and other worlds that is the basis of human civilization because it is where we picked up the idea that there was something more to us than that which we lived by, for, have lived by for most of our created existence. For 150, more like 165,000 years, we lived in a kind of dream world. And I say a dream world because it was, it was a, in, in many ways, a more real world than this one is in the sense that we had absolutely no idea that there was anything like time, that there was anything that we couldn't see in front of our faces, or that anything really changed and probably had only a very limited idea even of what death was. But then suddenly we began to walk. Something happened. Something happened, and not just in southern Europe, but all around the world. Uh, it's one thing to say that people began to eat mushrooms in southern Europe, perhaps because of a climate change. They were hungry, and they began to eat what they could, and this remarkable change took place. But it's bigger than that, isn't it, Graham? Oh, it's much bigger than that. This is, this is all around the world. It's amazing how that... You go back to that horizon of 35,000 years ago, and within 10,000 years of that, all around the world, this, this revolution in human behavior has, uh, ha has taken place. And I, I, think, I think the word got around. Uh, once it was understood that, uh, that, that these amazing experiences could be unleashed by consuming certain plants, our ancestors started to look actively for those plants. And, and of course, plants um, that, uh, that, that are capable of, of unleashing these experiences are indeed found, uh, found all around the world and are still used by hunter-gatherer cultures, by, by shamanic cultures, such as the Indians of the, uh, of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, who make use of, a, of an amazing combination of two plants uh, to produce what's called the ayahuasca brew, the, the vine of soul that uh, puts them in direct contact with, with the other world and the supernatural beings who inhabit it. So, the, it, but it's dependent. Now, you have actually done this, and this is another remarkable thing about supernatural. It's not only a journey to various places in the world, it's an inner journey as well. Because you duplicated, he duplicated, folks, the actual journey that must have been taken by the people doing the cave art thousands upon thousands of years ago. Brian, uh, Graham, tell me, what exactly was it like? What did you do? Oh, well, we've, got, we've come well, up on a break, Graham, excuse me. We'll be right back, and when we get back, this is, we'll obviously be talking about some, one of the most fascinating journeys you have ever heard. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back talking with Graham Hancock. He's going to be at the CPAC conference October the 10th through the 15th at the UC Irvine in California. But he's also doing a tour. He's going to be in quite a number of different places. And I believe, Graham, that this tour, that they can find out about this tour on GrahamHancock.com, can't they? Yeah, it's on my, it's on my website, GrahamHancock.com. There's a page called Supernatural, uh, and there's another page called Talks and Events, and both of them uh, contain listings of my upcoming U.S. tour. 
Well, he's going to be at the Learning Annex in San Diego on October the 11th. He's going to be at the Learning Annex in Los Angeles October the 17th. And Ann and I are Graham Hancock groupies. You will see us uh, around uh, if you go to any of these things. We'll certainly be at the CPAC conference, hopefully at the Learning Annex in L.A., because we think, I, I think I am talking to one of the most important thinkers, intellectuals, and adventurers in the world today. Now let's get back to this question of actually taking these drugs. You did this. What was it like? I, I, I did, uh, and, I, and I did it because I, I feel that I cannot present an authentic study to my readers unless I directly experience the thing that I'm talking about. And the hypothesis, the suggestion is that our ancestors made their great leap forward to become fully human uh, as a result not of the alert uh, problem-solving consciousness that is favored in our society today, but of deeply altered states of consciousness that our society dismisses as hallucinations. Uh, and it seemed to me uh, b- bizarre that we should, on the one hand, accept that something supposedly so trivial as experiencing hallucinations could have transformed human behavior and given us our greatest leap forward in six million years. Um, that that uh, you know we uh, and yet not examine what hallucinations actually are, because most of the academics working in this field. Uh, simply uh, have a prejudice about these things called hallucinations and don't have any direct experience of them themselves. So I decided I had to experience that, and I wanted to do it in the way that shamans do. Uh, and so for that reason, I chose certain plants that are, that are used in shamanic cultures all around the world. One of them was ibogaine. It comes from, from Central Africa. It was, it was originally used by the pygmies, and it's now passed on into other peoples in Central Africa. It's a root bark, uh, and um, when you take it, you get very, very ill, and, and then you start to experience visions and encounters very often with deceased ancestors and with, uh, with intelligent beings uh, that are not of this world. Uh, I went to, to the Amazon, to Peru, to drink ayahuasca with shamans there. Uh, ayahuasca means the vine of soul, uh, and it means so for a very good reason, because again, uh, it offers this contact with another realm. If, 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 if one wants to prepare oneself for death, there is no better preparation than the, than the ayahuasca uh, experience. Which, which leads us on into, into another world that exists beyond this physical world. Of course, I took psilocybin mushrooms, uh, which are almost certainly the agent that was, that was, uh, that energized the consciousness of our ancestors in, in Upper Paleolithic uh, Europe. And I took uh, DMT, the, the substance that was used in Rick Strassman's uh, studies and another a number of other substances as well. I wanted to experience these things before judging what hallucinations are. I wanted to experience them and then come to my conclusion. And the conclusion that I've that I've come to to cut a to cut a long story short is that we're dealing with a really profound mystery here, uh, and that hallucinations are another kind of perception. They are not fantasies that are just cooked up in the brain. They are another form of perception of another kind of reality. And this is why these astonishing universals occur and why it's even possible for people to meet each other in the other world, which is what shamans do all the time. One simply must master the techniques and what's needed above all else is experience. And I decided to expose myself to that kind of experience. And although it was terrifying at times and extremely upsetting, uh, because it just stripped away all my preconceptions about the nature of reality. It was, it was fundamentally a nourishing and important series of, of experiences that have changed utterly the way I look at the world. Now, let's talk a little bit about those experiences, and let's go back to Iboga. We had, have had Daniel Pinchbeck on this radio program, and he's going to be on again this fall. And, it, it, I've, in fact, I think he will already have been on by the time uh, we, we're, you're going to, this, I, I'm not quite sure what my schedule is, but we're recording yeah. a couple of shows in advance, so we might be that Daniel Pinchback, of course, he went to to so, so, to Africa and, and d- took a boga himself, wrote a remarkable book about his experiences. 
tell us a little bit about your experiences with iboga and ayahuasca. Yeah. Your well, in the case of iboga, in the case of iboga, I took it uh, in the UK and, in fact, in my own home. Um, I- I- iboga sometimes kills people. Uh, it has. Um, you, you took it, it under the care of a doctor, I might add. Uh, I did. I had a I had a medical doctor present throughout the forty eight hours that I was under the influence of iboga. Yeah, because this is not uh, to be trifled with, folks. Don't run out and grab some iboga just for fun. This isn't. This is not yes, fun. I, I, and I, it's think not... It's, I think it's important. When we talk about these things, it's important to emphasize this is a very serious business. I, I'm not extremely talking about serious, and drugs. and also don't disobey the law. Graham didn't. He obeyed the law in 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 so far as it's constituted in Britain when he was carrying out these experiments. This is not. We're not talking about illegal acts here at all. So not a, not at all. Iboga Iboga is in fact legal in Britain, although it's illegal in the United States. So I chose to take Iboga in Britain, and when I drank ayahuasca. I didn't take it in Britain. I went to Peru, where in the Amazon, again, it is totally 100% legal. And in fact, is, its legality is protected under laws of, uh, of religious freedom uh, throughout uh, South America. Uh, so I was very careful not to break any laws, and I went to great lengths in order to do that, because otherwise I would simply expose myself to, to more and more unprincipled uh, 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 attacks. But I also felt that it was very important not to stick my head in the sand. I had to have these experiences in order to know uh, what, I, what I was writing about. Now, in the case of Iboga, uh, it, it brought me together in a very moving and, and, and tantalizing sense with the, the spirit of my deceased father. Uh, my, my father died uh, in September 2003, and, and for, for, for various reasons that I shall eternally regret, I was unable to be at his bedside uh, when, when this happened. Uh, Iboga gave me the chance for some, some further contact with him, um, because his spirit was very much present uh, during this 48 hours of pain and trauma that I went through uh, under the influence of Iboga. And I do have to say that Iboga really breaks your body on the wheel. It is, it is, uh, it is an agonizing thing to take, uh, but, but, but incredibly rewarding in terms of the experience it unleashes. It also, it also made me think a lot about my own life and, and mistakes that I'd made, and it brought to the fore issues of conscience that I had buried for many years and made me, made me think about wrong turnings and wrong directions that I'd taken in my life and helped me to review uh, my life and, and and set off on a more positive track uh, uh, afterwards. It was really uh, a, an absolutely amazing experience, but because of the, the very powerful physical consequences, I mean, this literally flattened me for 48 hours, and, and during most of that time I was, I, I was vomiting and had a terrible thudding headache. I couldn't even walk. Uh, I think Iboga is not, is not a substance that I will be trying again, uh, but it was, uh, it was extremely interesting to have the... Experience ayahuasca uh, with the well, shaman well, let's, let's in Peru. Wait, Graham. Let's not leave a boga just now, okay. uh, because you talked about your experience with your father, but there was another being that was involved as well, as I recall. Yes, there were. There were. There was a being, a, 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 a huge dancer, uh, who seemed to who seemed to be dancing a kind of a rhythmic. Uh, Rhythmic motions in the in in uh, seemingly in the room with me, and 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 the room itself transformed. I found myself in a, in another place. It was like I'd been taken off into some, I don't know, some kind of bubble um, out of outside of outside of space and and, and time. I encountered um, a, 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 an individual that many people who who, who drink uh, who who, who uh, consume iboga encounter, and this is thought to be the spirit of iboga. Uh, and he almost always appears to people as an African man, and uh, and I encountered this individual too, and there was a sense of of telepathic uh, communication. He seemed to be staring deep into my soul and revealing everything that I had hidden from myself and telling me I had to put my life right, I had to fix my life, and so it was it was uh, a revealer of truth in a way. It, 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 it told me truths about myself, and that's why I believe these experiences are nourishing and why I can understand how they played such a huge role in transforming the human race. And he, incidentally, also inspired Ann Streber, because when Graham originally told us about him and the green, the color green that was associated with his skin in, in Graham's 
Oh, oh well, there, now this was yes. You're reminding me now, Whitney, because this was another uh, another part of that vision was was a vision that one would almost describe as a ghost. This wasn't the African uh, figure, but this was a this was a white man, uh, and 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 suddenly he was beside me. And 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 then as I as I looked up at him, I saw that his face was covered in in patches of of green mold, uh, some kind of green vegetation growing grow, growing on him. And 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 was was he a ghost? What what was he? And I think Anne was absolutely right to identify this figure with the green man uh, that that's so prominent in in uh, in ancient European folklore. Those experiences certainly came from altered states of consciousness. And you can go to unknowncountry.com to Anne's diary and read The Green Man, uh, which has been a really a lot of people have commented on that on that diary entry, and uh, I think it's extraordinarily powerful. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going in a completely different direction with Graham Hancock. We're going into the world of the UFO experience and abductees. But we're not going to be talking about it in quite the way we're used, you're used to. We're going to be talking about the mystery of the bones. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. We're back with Graham Hancock, his phenomenal new book, Supernatural, Meetings with the Ancient Teachers of Mankind. Graham Hancock has figured out what happened, what began the human mind, not civilization, but even before that, what began the human mind. And he has gone there and done that by duplicating the use of, of the mushrooms and the other drugs that were being taken at the time that the cave paintings in Lascaux and in southern France and in northern Spain were actually being painted and has duplicated those experiences in his own life using, in some cases, exactly the same drugs. We have talked about uh, Iboga and Ayahuasca, but we, we have limited time and I want you to know, to go to the book, to go to Supernatural and find out the journey he took to, to, to discover and use the drugs that must have been used by the cave painters themselves and why he believes that they were not only used by the cave painters, but all over the world, even up until modern times in Africa. Before we go on, Graham, why don't you briefly tell us of the extraordinary and tragic story of the tribe in Africa that was still living in this way up until modern times. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. These are the the San, the Southern San Bushmen of uh, of South Africa. The earliest surviving works of art that they have handed down to us date back twenty seven thousand years, and these Bushmen, who were masters of the toughest terrain in the world. Uh, continued to paint these amazing works of art in rock shelters right through until the beginning of the 20th century. Now, uh, it's very important to emphasize that they attained their altered states of consciousness not through drugs, but through a rhythmic dance, which they called the trance dance. They would literally dance all night uh, until they fell into a deeply altered state of consciousness. And then they went to the same other world that other shamans get to using, using plant hallucinogens. But the white uh, powers that be in Southern Africa, the, 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 who, who controlled Southern Africa for so long, utterly despised the San and treated them literally like vermin. And astonishingly and amazingly, up until 1927, it was possible for whites in South Africa to purchase a license to hunt the San, to shoot them down just the way they shot animals. And this is why they became extinct because they were wiped out by the brutality and violence of our civilization when, in fact, they had so much to teach us. But they left behind rock art made in an altered state, and what was on it but the made. same dots that you see in the cave art in southern France. 
not only the same dots and patterns, but also the same beings that are part animal, part human, that are in this process of transformation between, between human and, and animal. We find the same beings painted on the rock shelters in South Africa as we do in the cave walls in southern Africa. And uh, in, in, it's all about altered states of consciousness. And how, these altered states can be induced by a variety of different means and techniques. Uh, um, one of them is, is hallucinogens. It's very clear that a small proportion of every population, I would put the figure at around 2%, are able to fall into a trance state spontaneously. And this is very important, I believe, in, in understanding the UFO abduction uh, phenomenon that, that takes place today. And my own uh, experience, and others, of course. Which is, and your own experience. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, let's go now to a case that you probably you may not know about, but it's very germane, the Karina Sables case. And I will set the scene very simply. Karina Sables and a friend of hers were out looking at stars in British Columbia when they had a completely extraordinary close encounter of the third kind. Two aliens, their eyes glowing green in the flashlights of these terrified women came out of the forest beside the road where they had stopped to stargaze, and there followed an experience that left the friend, deep, both of them, of course, shattered, and the friend with a bad burn at the base of her spine and a memory of something being done to her spine. Now, when I read, it got deeply into supernatural, and I read this like it was like food for me. I have to tell you, it was an unbelievably powerful reading experience. I got to a, one of the later chapters in which there is a seg segment called The Mystery of the Bones, it, during which you discuss the relationship between this past material and the close encounter experience. And there is definitely a relationship. It is a shamanic oh, experience. A huge, there, but people are having huge, it with absolutely no drugs. What's going on? Well, what's happening, what's happening is that 2% of every population have the ability to fall spontaneously into deeply altered states of consciousness. Um, their brain chemistry is just so adjusted that they can that they that their, the receiver wavelength of their brains uh, adjusts uh, spontaneously without any input. They don't have to trance dance all night. They don't have to take ayahuasca. Uh, the experience just comes upon them uh, suddenly. Sometimes when it affects groups of people, I think electromagnetic fields may be involved, uh, where, where large numbers of people have these have have, have, have these experiences. Uh, but but in, 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 in every case, what is involved, I think, is an altered state of consciousness. And, and I mean, really, to cut a long story short, there are astonishing similarities between the accounts given by shamans of their encounters with spirits. Frequently, they are abducted by those spirits. Frequently, they have sexual relations with those spirits. Frequently, those spirits do painful operations on them in the spirit world. Uh, between the beings that our ancestors in the European Middle Ages used to call fairies, who again abducted human beings and did very strange things to them in strange settings, uh, and the modern experience of uh, abduction by uh, aliens. I, I think that it's actually the same experience that is happening in every case. It's documented on the cave walls, and it's continuing today, but it's seen through different p cultural spectacles. Uh, and because interpretation is built into perception from the outset, we today interpret these experiences as encounters with aliens, uh, whereas in the past they were interpreted as encounters with fairies uh, or with spirits. And it's very interesting that, that the UFO abductees regularly report that the alien often appears to them in an animal form first, or in a form that is part animal, part human. Or the change into an animal or, form, as has happened or, in my case. Exactly, or change or transform into an animal form. The same is true if you go in detail into the reports of fairies in the Middle Ages, and the same is absolutely true in the case of the reports given by shamans of the beings they encounter in altered states of consciousness. So my feeling is that this, this, uh, these, these beings, these intelligences, are all around us all the time. But most of us are so rigidly tuned in to what Rick Strassman calls channel normal 
that we just aren't able to see them. We just can't register them on our senses. But and those it, it few folks, of us, it's not that it's not that it's not a something conscious. It's it goes deeper than that. This tuning in to channel normal. It's something we can't help any more than 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 we can. We need. We just. It's just the way we are, and it's very frustrating. It's a state I'm in most of my life, and we all are. Yes. But 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 I well, want to go in a slight. That, let's say that some of Please us, go ahead. Some of us are, let's say that some of us are able to tune into those experiences spontaneously, and you are, you are certainly one of those in, in my view. Let's say that others need help. I'm one of those who need help. Uh, I had those experiences. I had an experience that I could only describe as a UFO abduction experience under the influence of ayahuasca. And many of the shamans uh, in Peru uh, report encounters with UFOs. And, and going right back to the cave walls, as I show in Supernatural, there are paintings of beings that look just like the, the beings that we call greys today, right there on cave walls 35,000 years ago. So whatever's going on here, it's the same thing that's been going on for tens of thousands of years, and it has been absolutely instrumental and fundamental uh, in making us human, in bringing us forward out of those boring six million years of eight-man ancestry and into the modern uh, extraordinary behavior that humans now have. I, you know, let me, I think that the reason for this is that this other world exists. I think it's a parallel universe. I think it's right here. Yes. And I think it's yes. also extra-temporal in that it doesn't have yes. the same relationship to time that ours does which gives them a very, very different perspective on life, and it's that perspective that the the connection with that or touching that perspective that created the human mind. How do you react to that? I, I completely agree with you. I think that's exactly what's what's going on here. Uh, that the greatest influence on humanity has been an influence from beyond this physical world. Uh, has been an influence from beyond the veil, from from parallel universes. But, but again, I repeat, in my view, we interact with them. They're all around us. They're with us at all times. But most of us can't see them because because we are just so plugged into the daily grind of physical life. And yes. what's needed, some of us some of us are, are fortunate, or perhaps some might say unfortunate enough to have these experiences spontaneously. But for others, the techniques that shamans in hunter-gatherer cultures have developed over thousands of years, and those techniques do often involve the use of, of plants. Uh, these techniques allow us to tap into those same experiences. And for the first time, and Rick Strassman did note this in his research at the University of New Mexico, they allow us to do a targeted, almost scientific exploration of this other world. We can keep on at will going back and revisiting it, uh, through through the use of, 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 of plants like the ayahuasca vine. Uh, and we can compare the experiences of many different volunteers. So, so for the first time, there's a possibility of an actual systematic scientific investigation of the supernatural. Uh, and when, once we realize that, that the key is human consciousness, we don't need something like a ghost beater or some, other, some kind of fancy instrument. We simply need to work with our own consciousness, this amazing instrument that's inside our own skull, and to retune the receiver wavelength of the brain, and suddenly these other realities come clear to us, and we can get into direct communication with them. Now, in the case of many close encounter witnesses, including myself, this is elaborately a part of their own physical world, and provably so, in the sense that, yes. in my case, we often had 10, 15, 20 people at our cabin having physical encounters, and I had the, the visitors, as I call them, in my life physically for 11 years. You spoke about sexual contact. I've spoken in my subscriber section very frankly about the sexual contact I had, and believe me, it was entirely physical with physical beings who were not of this world. And Absolutely. There's, there's could, no uh, doubt that there is a, be, Graham, there's let a me, breakthrough. Let, let me just ask you a question. That they also have a science and a technology and have recently learned to emerge into our physical world, at least at times, and that's why it's changed like this, or has it changed? How do, what, what do you think? I, I think that I think that that they, whoever or whatever they are, have been have been actively engaged with human beings for thirty five thousand years since the first documents of that were recorded on the cave walls. Uh, 
Uh, and I think that they have been breaking through into our physical world uh, in all that time. Uh, and the latest manifestation that they use to break through is, is, is what we see as, uh, as, as the UFO. But if you go back to the, to the Middle Ages, uh, you know, you have the, the phenomenon of the fairy dance, this right. tremendous fast-moving circular dance, which, which can physically just take a person out of this world and put them into, uh, into the other world, where sometimes they remain for hundreds of years, returning in what they think is a day and finding that everybody they knew has passed away and that they're a vague memory from many generations before. Outside of um, time. I, 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 I think these breakthroughs are happening, happening all the time, and they're, they're, they are happening more and more often. Graham, I want to thank you for being with us, really from the bottom of my heart. It's been one of the most extraordinary interviews I've ever had with anybody. And uh, Graham's new book, Supernatural, don't miss it. And I mean that, don't miss it. Because if if you're after getting uh, uh, rising up out of that channel, that normal channel, this is one way to do it. Supernatural Meetings with the Ancient Teachers of Mankind, written by a man who has done it personally. Wow. You can get it from the unknowncountry.com store. You can get it in bookstores everywhere, but you must get it. Graham's website, grahamhancock.com. He will be at the CPAC conference in California on in October 13th through 15th. He has a tour all up and down the west coast of the United States. Go to his website. Find out if he's going to be near you, Portland, Seattle, Boulder, all kinds of places. Don't miss this. Graham Hancock, one of the extraordinary journeyers of our era, could be face-to-face with you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Whitley. You're about to experience something that you just can't get elsewhere. Emmy Award winning science reporter Linda Moulton Howe reporting on the absolute leading edge of science, discovery, and the true mysteries of the unknown. Don't miss her website, earthfiles.com, the one science website that tells you the secrets and gives you the facts others dare not earthfiles.com. This week, she's reporting on five intense radio bursts that were picked up from the center of the galaxy a couple of years ago, and the work has been done to learn more about them since. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. A year and a half ago, in early March of 2005, I reported at Earth Files in Dreamland about a physicist's report in nature of a powerful and repeating burst of radio waves toward the center of our Milky Way galaxy. The galactic center is 26,000 light years from Earth, and it is full of stars. And there were five radio bursts in one-meter-long radio wavelengths of 330 megahertz, detected over a seven-hour period on the night of September 30th to October 1st, 2002. Those five radio bursts were equally spaced apart by 77 minutes exactly, and there were no detectable X-ray emissions. No one studying our galaxy has ever seen any radio bursts like that before. The source is a complete mystery. Now this year, on March 1, 2006, the same science team published in the Astrophysical Journal New data about another similar radio burst detected on September 28, 2003. That was a single burst caught by good luck in a short 10-minute observation. No one knows if there were other bursts before and after the one detected from Earth. The 2003 single radio burst was approximately three times weaker than the five radio bursts in 2002. Still, No one knows what the source of such similar radio bursts toward the center of our galaxy could be. And a possible third radio burst is being analyzed right now from 2004 data. The lead scientist monitoring the center of our Milky Way galaxy is Scott Hyman, Ph.D. and professor of physics in the Department of Physics and Engineering at Sweetbriar College in Sweetbriar, Virginia. 
He began his research a few years ago at the request of a colleague at the Naval Research Laboratory. Why the Navy would want to investigate radio signals in the galactic core is not known. But the strong repeating radio bursts on regular intervals without X-ray emissions, as sometimes is found in some natural cosmic emitters, this provokes at least a question. Could the source be another cosmic civilization? I recently talked with Professor Hyman about that question and what more he has learned about the powerful, repeating, long-wave radio bursts. It's still an enigma, but the five bursts that were emitted were detected by the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico. The array at that point was pointed toward the galactic center, and the Very Large Array is a set of 27 dish antennas coordinated so to act as one large antenna the size of those 27 to give you very high resolution and high sensitivity radio images. So the object could have been anywhere in principle between us and the galactic center. We do not know the distance determination yet. And when I was analyzing the data two years later, I can describe the that eureka feeling I had when I was looking at the data, which was compiled from all of six hours, and I saw a little radio source, a little blob on the image of the galactic center that normally is not there. And at this point, I've been monitoring for so long that I know pretty much every blob of radio emission that is a steady emitter. So what I did was I divided the data set up into halves in time, and sure enough, uh, I was able to home in on five, ten-minute or so bursts where it was very, very intense, and then in between, there was no emission at all. So this is a very exciting moment. These bursts came in a very regular interval, didn't they? Yes, yes, that's right. They came 77 minutes apart, give or take 30 seconds. The problem is that we didn't, the observation was only six hours long, and we do not know how long those bursts were occurring after the detection ended after the observation ended or before the observation began. So it could have been going on much longer. Now, having said that, I should tell you that we have been doing more monitoring. Since we published the paper, we applied for more observation time to detect this source again and have been monitoring all this year, 2006, and have not detected it again in our current observations. However this is the good news, that, again, we found the source in data from 2003, and two years or three years too late to follow it up. <laughs> so we now have two detections of the source, the five bursts from 2002 in September, October, and then one burst we detected in September 03 in data taken by the uh, giant Metrowave radio telescope in India. And was that first, the same, uh, some 70 some minutes apart? Well, that's the problem. Only, we only detected one burst, but that data was not taken in a contiguous manner. In other words, that instrument observes typically 10 minutes at a time with some spacing in between for calibration or other observations. And so we caught one burst, but we may have missed the others, if there were others. Now, is one of the big anomalies about these repeating radio bursts that there are no associated X-rays? In this case, yeah. We looked in the archives of various X-ray telescope facilities and did not find any X-rays emitted near the time that we saw the burst, detected the burst of the radio. We also did our own search in 2005 with the Chandra X-ray telescope, which is NASA's orbiting satellite telescope, and uh, did not detect bursts or any steady emission. We were hoping we would find a source of X-rays that was steady. There are other transient sources that exhibit steady, constant emission and then periodically burst. But we did not find that. So on the one hand, we were disappointed. On the other hand, it adds to the mystery of what the source is. You're talking about an unknown distance and that the power of this in order to be perceived here on Earth must be gigantic. Yes, the luminosity is what we're really after, and of course we don't know that because we don't know the distance. 
But if it is at the galactic center, because we were just pointing toward the galactic center, then it is a very bright radio transit, a very luminous object, strong bursts, and one of the stronger radio bursts ever detected. If you look, for example, at the galactic center, then there are other objects that are as bright. If they're all at the same distance, then they're as luminous. The difference is this regular interval of a strong radio signal without any associated X-ray. That is one of the mysteries, yes. And the other interesting feature about it that would tend to rule out a nearby object is that we have not detected any circular polarization. In other words, radio emission can be polarized, which is a characteristic of the waves of radio emission. And nearby brown dwarf stars or flare stars tend to be polarized. And we did not detect polarization in the burst that we detected. We also detected it at a low frequency for radio waves. Our monitoring program is uh, at 330 megahertz, precisely because we get a large field of view at that low frequency, so we can monitor over a fairly large region of the sky. The low frequencies, we have not detected bursts from these nearby flare stars or brown dwarfs, typically. So it doesn't really fit well a brown dwarf or um, flare star signature. Do you and your colleagues have any speculation now in 2006 fall about what it might be? Well, we have been working on a paper that modeled the source as a magnetar, which is a highly magnetized object, a very collapsed star like, like a pulsar, but even more magnetized so that would power extreme bursts like this. But now the picture is getting more complicated because of the second detection that we had, and we have some evidence that it really did not repeat. That really was an isolated burst, even though we had only 10 minutes every hour. There are some other observations further afield, which we might have still detected this source 77 minutes later or earlier, if it had been emitting. And I should point out that we have possibly a third detection, and again, another archival data set from 2004. Hmm. We're still analyzing that data, so it's a tentative detection. And if it's true, its strength would have diminished quite a lot. It's a faint detection. One burst again, 30 times fainter mm -hmm. than the others. So we're being very careful to determine whether this is a uh, bona fide detection or not. But if, in fact, its strength is decaying, that will then complicate matters as to the origin of the radio emission. Sorry to say, we, we just don't have really any definitive idea or, or any additional information since 2002, except that it's still alive, that we have been detected in 2003 and 2004. Since SETI is convinced there is other life out there, why couldn't this mysterious series of radio bursts be from a far distant civilization? Well, um, you know, that's something that would be so exciting, and I actually do believe that SETI has at least filed this detection in its archives as one to keep an eye on. Nothing is ruled out except that the wise scientists will, will always try to rule out the more uh, mundane, <laughs> shall we say, explanations before going there. Well, it seems in a way that science is in a strange straitjacket. SETI and Carl Sagan and so many others over the years have talked about the billions and billions of planets that should have life out there in the universe and that we have been looking in a variety of frequencies vis-a-vis -vis SETI. And when something like this happens that you have been able to monitor over three years, why is it that the first possibility is not that you may finally have gotten a signal, a strong radio signal repeating from a civilization? Well, that would be the most extraordinary conclusion that would demand the most evidence. Carl Sagan had a great adage where he said, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence or extraordinary proof. So the more extraordinary the, the claim, the more sure you've got to be. And so the threshold for the evidence pointing in that direction, the bar would have to be set very, very high. But the problem we have is we just haven't detected it enough to make it, to, to really rule out anything definitively and to constrain new models. If our evidence that it's not emitting every 77 minutes anymore is true, 
And that will constrain models of the source. And uh, some of the papers that have been published suggest that it could be a double pulsar or it could be a white dwarf pulsar. Various things would may or may not be able to explain why it isn't emitting every 77 minutes when it does emit. How would you prove if this were a strong radio signal from an advanced civilization in the galactic center? I would imagine you would need repeated You'd have to find a signal in the haystack that is a message, a statement, a code, a something that cannot be explained naturally. And I really don't want to go there anymore. Okay, well, it just seems like that this is so amazing and still an enigma after all this time that it would be fascinating to think about how we on Earth might go about trying to see if it was some kind of advanced intelligence. Sure. Well, the only way to do it is to keep monitoring and get more data. Mm -hmm. The first thing is experimental in this case. We can't go there. <laughs> so we have to wait until it uh, bursts again, and we have to hope that we're uh, detecting it. But one can't speculate in any logical direction unless one has more evidence, more data. Well, what is now the current plan that you have with which instruments and where to keep monitoring? We have a program this year where we're monitoring approximately every week with the Very Large Array, which is run by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in New Mexico. And also we're monitoring with the uh, GMRT, the Giant Metrowave Radio Telescope in India. When you take both instruments together, they're monitoring approximately once a week. And we've analyzed much of that data and have not detected it. And we have been awarded more monitoring time with the Indian Telescope for the next six months, right, into next year, first part of 2007. Uh, the Very Large Array won't be in a configuration where we can monitor with it again until later in 07. So we are, uh, we are still monitoring, still hopeful that we'll detect it and other uh, objects like that. The importance of the detection, even if we don't detect it again, even if we never figure out what it is, is that it demonstrates that there are phenomena out there that at low frequencies we can detect. And again, low frequencies is important because you can observe a wide field of view and there are new instruments that are being developed at low frequencies to take advantage of that wide field of view and that will have even higher resolution and higher sensitivity so that many more classes of transient radio sources will be able to be observed. Mm -hmm. So the more that we open the window up to detecting new phenomena, the more we'll be able to understand and perhaps be able to put this source into a context that contains other discoveries at low frequencies. If this really is a new class of objects, again, it, it really will impact the future searches for radio phenomena at low frequencies. It really does underscore the need to open up that window, as I said, on, on the universe. And this is basically the first time that scientists have had a concentration in very low frequencies on the galactic center? It's um, been about 10 years or so since the first really dedicated low frequency observations have gotten underway. As far as I know, ours is the first to monitor the galactic center at low frequencies. And there are other monitoring projects with other telescopes at somewhat higher frequencies, but again, they will be constrained by their field of view and other limitations as well. And so SETI has never looked in this low frequency before? No, I'm not saying that they haven't looked at low frequencies, but their searches are designed in different ways. The field of view is not just dictated by the frequency, but by the antennas and the instruments that are receiving that low frequency. Mm -hmm. So you need both the low frequency and a certain type of instrumentation to get the large field of view. And I'm really not familiar with their special techniques that they're using to search for extraterrestrial signals, right. which I would imagine be much more uh, frequency dependent. They're looking at particular frequencies, whereas we're looking at a, a bandwidth of frequencies at low frequencies. Is part of your students' excitement because you all may be on the verge of discovering perhaps another intelligence? 
no, I'd have to say not. <laughs> That's not uh, what's exciting about it for us. We, we're excited about the possibility of having detected a, a new natural source of radio emission, because that will open up perhaps a new science, new understanding of how our universe works or how compact stars emit such large bursts and the energetics involved deep within that, that star that causes such events to happen. Now, I'm not going to tell you, I haven't fantasized that it isn't <laughs> extraterrestrial life <laughs> at times, but that's not why I had a eureka moment. Okay. Well, if Sagan and Drake at Cornell were right about billions of planets in this universe that would have life, which does have logic, do you think that we have not discovered signals coming from other solar systems someplace, the way we emit in the electromagnetic spectrum so much from this planet? The big universe, our instruments are too primitive. Uh, the signals, by the time they get to us, are too weak. Not enough intelligent life. Who knows? That's probably the big mystery, isn't it? Yeah. If you believe that there is intelligence, of course, if you don't believe that there is intelligent life, then it's no mystery at all. Wouldn't that seem illogical, that there wouldn't be other intelligent life in this huge universe? To me it is, but... Often, you are always cautioned about extrapolating from one point. Still, I would agree with you. Well, I think your work is exciting on all fronts, natural or possibly another civilization. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Hyman is currently preparing yet another paper about the possible 2004 single radio burst, again for publication in the Astrophysical Journal in 2007, and the Naval Research Lab is also contributing to the construction of the world's largest and most sensitive low-frequency telescope called the Long Wavelength Array. It could revolutionize future searches for other radio transient sources in our galaxy and beyond. And part of the Long Wavelength Array is expected to be built near the very large array in Dadal, New Mexico. It's not expected to be operational until around 2011, and by then, the array of interferometers, which will look for cosmic radio bursts, could spread out over western New Mexico and perhaps into the states beyond. So Whitley, depending upon this work of Dr. Hyman at Sweetbriar and what at the Naval Research Lab, by the time that this uh, long wavelength array is finally ready to go, perhaps in 2011, uh, his hope is that they will have found even more of these repeating bursts that match the 2002 uh, uh, every 77 minutes. You know, that's fascinating, Linda. And the reason, one of the sort of sidelights that I can contribute regarding the Naval Research Lab is that one of the few, in fact, the only government lab I know of, official government lab, that was ever really interested in the implants that Bill Mallow and I had worked on at Southwest Research was an element of the Naval Research Lab. And maybe maybe they know there's something out there, which is why they're so interested in doing this. Maybe they'd like to see if they can find it. Exactly. I mean, that is my own suspicion as well. But you can tell that with the astrophysics world and the hard physics world, it is so difficult for the men and women who are trying in their own way uh, to break ground in their cosmic search to even use the word extraterrestrial because it has become so politically uh, unacceptable. And oh. isn't it sad because these, what if these radio pulses are from another civilization? Well, one of the risks that we run in a scientific community that is uh, so uh, uh, that that guards expectations so so carefully that people's careers are jeopardized if they speculate too much, we run the risk of missing something like that because it, it is quite true what Carl Sagan said that we could expect aliens to be stranger almost than we can imagine and there's there, i mean there is truth in that but it's limited truth uh however 
it might be that there are very, very different ways of affecting uh, the universe around us and using and communicating through it, and that something like this coming from the galactic center is, if it is intelligently it, or, or, or originated, maybe it's not even for the purpose of communication. Maybe it's a side effect of something else that they're doing. So. Right. Who knows? It's, but it's really, really fascinating to follow up with him and find that there's all been all this much more. Because the bottom line is this. If there are radio bursts with no x-rays accompanying them right now, we don't know how that could be. Exactly. That's right. And uh, Dr. Hyman is at least open-minded to the possibility that there could be another intelligence out there. And as he himself said... Uh, I have to admit I have fantasized about it and that it would be exciting, but the scientists have to be so careful, and this is why over the next uh, several years leading up to the uh, construction of that long wavelength array with the uh, Naval Research Lab, that if they keep monitoring with the Indian uh, instruments and what they're working with here, and what if they get another five of those radio bursts? And we, it would be fascinating if, in fact, the so-called intelligence in the universe was confirmed first from our galactic center instead of from our own Earth. Well, Linda Moulton-Howe, thank you.